Okay. I welcome everybody and I'm glad to see everybody. I'm Terry Torres, a Fawns Museum board member, and I thank you all for being here. The Filipino American National Historical Society, or Fawns, it's a nationwide nonprofit organization that was established in 1982 with its headquarters in Seattle, Washington. And now we have 40 chapters across the United States. Our mission in a nutshell is to collect the Filipino American history in the United States, preserve it in the National Archives in Seattle and showcase it in our national museum located in Stockton. Our museum opened in 2016 after more than 20 years of fundraising and planning. And now we have a 1000 square foot gallery area that contains revolving exhibits all about Filipino American history beginning in 1587 to present day. And we hope that you'll be able to come and check it out sometime soon. Right now, because of COVID, we are only open on the weekends by appointment only. And we ask that you give us at least two weeks advance notice so that we can schedule our volunteers and then our visitors. And you can check out our website, fondsmuseum.com or our Facebook page, at Fonz Museum for telephone and email contact information. Every third Sunday of the month, we offer our Afternoon at the Museum speaker series. And since we can't have a big crowd at the museum now, we offer our presentations by Zoom. So I thank all of you for being here. And now I want to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Richard Tanaza, he's our current president of our Fonz Museum Board, and he is a retired professor of biology from University of the Pacific, and he will be speaking about the history of Stockton's Filipino Center. So Richard, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Terry. I gotta say at the beginning that I don't really consider myself to be an expert in the Filipino Center. It's been around for well, 50 years, more than 50 years, uh, including all the planning that went into it. So I know a little bit about it and I'm going to share some of the little I know with you today and bring in some kind of peripherally related material as background. So I'm going to see if I can start the slides. I'm not... Okay, do you see the, the talk story? Yes. Okay. It is, in July, the Fonz chapter newsletter carried this story about the Filipino Center. And I liked that they called it a place to call home. And I wrote it along with Doris and Louis Sahun. The Filipino Center is in Stockton, we all know, which is in the center of California's Central Valley, which is a good location for it for reasons we'll see. The first Asians to come to California in any numbers or to America in, in large numbers were the Chinese. So from 1848 to the 50s, they were here mining gold in the mountains and coming through Stockton. In the 1860s, they essentially built the, the railroad, at least the Western portion of the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad. Then after the railroad was finished, we had another big problem and that was that the great San Joaquin Sacramento Delta was a big marsh and California had just become a state shortly before and the state government, I don't know how they apportioned it out, but they gave or sold land to people who would reclaim it. So people who acquired the land hired these thousands of unemployed Chinese to work at building levees, which is something that they at least some of them knew how to do because they'd been doing this for like 5,000 years in China, build, uh, building levees to 
turn swamp land into agricultural land and settlement land. So the Chinese laborers took care of that. They made 1,100 miles of levees. And this resulted in, <clears throat> in the creation of as many islands. I think there are about nearly 200 now. These islands are fertile agricultural land. And the people who were responsible for or who owned the land wanted to farm it for profit. So there was a tremendous demand for farm laborers. And at first, the Chinese were available. They'd finished making the levees, turning the big swamp into prime agricultural land. Then they went to work in the fields where the Caucasian owners of the land. In 1882, the, Ch the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act prohibited the immigration of Chinese laborers and Japanese took over. So Japanese laborers then worked the field until 1907 when the US and Chinese or Japanese governments, sorry, signed an agreement they called the Gentleman's Agreement for some reason that banned the immigration into the US and emigration from Japan of laborers coming to the US. So they essentially banned Japanese labor. Now, this, when the Japanese laborers were banned, we needed, still needed labor. And again, we turned to the Orient and the US said, and this is another long, long story in itself, but the US fought a war against the people of the Philippines after the, the Filipinos had been fighting for against Spain and this, they were winning a war against Spain for their independence. So the US had to hurry because they wanted to get the Filipinos when they're still under the control of Spain on paper anyway. So they could say, well, we saved them from Spain instead of going into to take over an independent country. So the Filipinos lost the war to Spain. They were outgunned, tortured, killed. And this then gave the Filipinos the right to immigrate to the United States because they were no longer considered aliens since the Philippines was now a colony of the United States, they were considered nationals. And in 1906, sugar growers, the sugar growers organization in Hawaii started actively recruiting Filipinos, mainly from the locals provinces, some from the Cebu area from central um, Philippines, the Visayans. So they're recruiting people to come to Hawaii. And shortly after that started, some people started coming from the Philippines directly to the United States. And those that went to Hawaii had three-year contracts. And some of them, when their contracts were up, went back to the Philippines or extended contracts or came to the mainland US. During the 1920s, there were 31,000 Filipinos entered California to work, according to Ronald Takaki. 93% were single, 84% were under 30. So you have all these young single men and what the young single men need, but young single women. But there was a, a problem with young single women. The, uh, the first, the majority of the men coming to California became farm workers and later laws in the 1930s excluded the Filipinos too, cut it down to 50 a year. So back to the handsome young men. Now this handsome young man is well known to at least one of us watching. This is Letty Perez's late husband, Frank Perez, getting all dolled up here. So the single young Filipinos were in a, a Filipinoist society coupled with anti-miscegenation laws that could not marry white women. So this left them with a serious problem of where to find full-time mates. There were white women available, at least in 
taxi dance halls and and some of the white women were willing to marry Filipinos, but they had to overcome the law, the anti-miscegenation law that prevented their marrying in California and all of the adjacent states, Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, went along with California in the anti-miscegenation laws. So one had to jump across at least one state to, or not one, but two, had to jump across at least one state to get to a place where they could marry. Those in Northern California went mainly to Washington State and the majority went to Vancouver, Washington, which is right across the border from, right across the Columbia River, which is the border from Portland. And others went to New Mexico or Utah. And in the 1930s, Oklahoma and some of the other southern central states of the United States experienced, experienced a drought and dust storms that kept them from making a living there any longer. So people were emigrating, leaving Oklahoma and some other states. They were, for the most part, uneducated and looking for farm work. Most of them headed to California, probably at least half of out of all of the, the, those that left Oklahoma came to California. This is a famous picture of a migrant mother taken by Dorothy Lang in 1936. That's the way my, my mother and her family left o Oklahoma. My mother was from Oklahoma, my dad from Ilocosur in the Philippines. So my mother's family left during the Dust Bowl, picked cotton in Texas and Arizona on the way to California. And finally they got to El Centro and in, El, in a migrant camp in El Centro. And there they heard there were jobs picking peas at Pescadero, south of San Francisco, about 50 miles. So they headed to Pescadero. Meanwhile, my mother's family was living in lean tos like this. And this woman in the foreground on the rocker actually looks somewhat like my like my mother. So they had, whoops. So these <clears throat> white women from Oklahoma and other South Central states, lonely, looking for possible mates, just like many of the young Filipinos were looking for possible mates, and they came together. So the, here's this woman dreaming of finding a Prince Charming, and suddenly here are all these princes charming in the fields who were lonely too, like she was. My parents met picking peas at Pescadero. They could not get married in California, as you know, so they went to Vancouver, Washington. When I was born, my mother was 16. They married when she was 15. She was 16 in two months. My dad was 33. And that kind of age gap was not unusual in those days as Letty can confirm. Some of the Filipinos had Filipino men that had Filipina wives. I think the majority of those though came from Hawaii. The more, more women went to Hawaii than directly to California. And some came from Hawaii to California, mainly with their husbands. So here's that red dot being Stockton again. Stockton became a focal point for Filipinos on the West Coast. First, there was lots of agriculture work right around Stockton. Secondly, it was kind of on a migration route. I mean, there's work up and down the Central Valley, but also south of the Central Valley and the Imperial Valley in the north in Washington and Oregon. And finally, in Alaska, where they jump off at Seattle and go to Alaska to work in the fish canneries or in the fishing boats as Mel Legasco, who's listening in, did in, uh, at a later time in the 1960s. The term Little Manila was introduced to sociology by two people, as far as I know. Carol Heminger, who I happen to know, wrote an article called Little Manila, the Filipino in Stockton prior to World War II and published it in University of Pacific's Journal of History, the Pacific Historian. And Don, in, in 2013, published Little Manila is in the Heart. And 
that's where most people from Don's writing rather than Carol's, which is not well known, <clears throat> learned of or the term Little Manila. And Letty tells me that even earlier than that, Frank, the handsome young man playing his tie in the mirror a little bit ago, was using the term Little Manila earlier when he was in Los Angeles writing for newspapers. Little Manila was full of places you're familiar with from pictures in Don's book. And some of you are familiar with them from actually having, whoops, having seen them, sorry. Every time I touch it, it jumps. So here are scenes in the Asian Filipino uh, businesses, for the most part, in the Asian area that became known as Little Manila. Originally, it was Chinese and Japanese and Filipinos. The Japanese were taken away during World War II, and some of the abandoned Japanese businesses were uh, taken over by Filipinos. Filipinos had businesses before that. That wasn't the only source of business. In the late 1960s, the city decided to have a freeway running across part of what was Little Manila. And so they had to destroy it, raise it with bulldozers to make room for the freeway. So here outlined is you know, the few blocks that uh, through John's work became known as Little Manila. And these are the blocks that were totally destroyed to make room for the freeway. Here's the freeway and Center Street is right here. And the freeway was supposed to come through here. So by 1969, they destroyed all of this. And, and 23 years later, they finally built the freeway. It was like, maybe you can't, can't help wondering if it was an excuse for destroying the neighborhood, but maybe not. Anyway, a lot of the familiar habitat was gone. Places to live were gone. The freeway wasn't there yet. The path had been cleared. 1975, the red arrow shows the end of the freeway in 1975, which is, as I said, Center Street was completed uh, years later. But meanwhile, Stockton's Filipino-American community mobilized to try to provide housing for the Filipinos, mainly the elderly retired farm worker Filipinos who were somewhat impoverished and living in Little Manila. A lot of other Filipinos were there that had businesses, but for the most part, they had homes elsewhere. So AFO, or the organization for uh, Filipinos formed an organization called Associated Filipinos of San Joaquin County or AFO. They raised money and I'll say more about this. In 1971, the Federal Housing Administration approved AFO to get a $2.8 million loan from HUD. And I'm gonna be repeating that too. And then the, the $2.8 million loan from HUD was to build affordable housing and the aim of the Filipino organizations, the main concern was for the displaced Filipinos, but the Filipino center was never only for Filipinos. So it was for anyone that qualified according to the HUD, qualified and was accepted by HUD to be housed there. So here's the Filipino center, you can see it was a little bit not far outside of the old Little Manila. Here's Lorena Cabanero's picture of some of the early, some of the manlans that she drew there. And here are more. So in the 1930s, we had all these young, sorry, young bachelor, bachelors. And some of them got married. And many who got married, maybe the majority, I'm not sure, married women of other races. So there was kind of a, a mestizo, mestizo generation of Filipinos, like myself, like Melagasca, like some of you are all mestizos. But in the 1960s, the young bachelors were now old bachelors. 
and not only in Stockland, but other agricultural areas as well. Here are Filipino men in 1961 standing on a street in Walnut Grove, not far from Stockland. The typical Filipino destined to become homeless when Little Manila was demolished was male, elderly, single, impoverished, an ex-farm worker, retired due to age or infirmity. Because most of these guys, I know when I was a kid, some of these guys were really ancient. They were still working in the fields. They worked as, as long as they could, as long as they could keep going to support themselves. Then <clears throat> the coalition of uh, Filipino organizations formed, led largely by Jose Bernardo, but many people were involved, not only Jose. And this is what become, became the Associated Filipino Organizations of San Joaquin County. Ted Lapus was the first president and Ted, I mean, uh, Jose was, a, was the advisor. Here's the AFO, Associated Filipino Organizations logo. And here's a little table of principal events. First, in 1967, Jose, Ted Lapus, and some UC Davis students interviewed elderly Filipinos living in Little Manila and found that the majority were unmarried, impoverished, male and ex-farm workers. Then 1967 also the AFO formed. 1967, Te uh, Jose, just coincidentally in the office where he had his building, uh, he had an office with two doors. His office was like a part of the hallway practically. So people leaving the building would walk through for, uh, Jose's office to get to the sidewalk. And one day he heard somebody say something about an Italian, I mean, a, a real estate. And so Jose asked, who is it that knows about affordable real estate here? He, this guy was involved with redevelopment. He was a redevelopment lawyer. And so it turned out to be somebody named Ted Lee, who was, who'd grown up in Stockton, went to university in Harvard, got his law degree at Harvard and came back. And at this time he was working for the city of Stockton. So Jose tracked him down, talked to him, told him about the need for land for the Filipino center. And Ted Lee told him about a square block of land that he was trying to get. He had been working with another ethnic group to secure the land for them but they kept flaking out and they never, they never followed through. And finally he gave up on them and turned to Jose. And so with his advice and know-how, Jose was able to get a promise from the city of this square block, two and a half acres of land. The organizations, the 10 Filipino American organizations that supported this, the made up of Filipino or AFO, put up $1,000 each for $10,000. But in 1967 dollars, that was equivalent in buying power to $83,000 uh, today. So FHA then agreed to the loan, the groundbreaking occurred, and we'll go on from there. So this is how Jose got the land. You'll see a picture of of Ted Lee. I don't know if anybody here knew Ted Lee. Ted Lee is still living and he's in his 90s, but he made lots and lots of money and he is living in Las Vegas. His wife passed away just a few years ago. But we owe a debt of gratitude to Ted Lee for helping find this land for the Filipino Center. April 1971, part of the AFO meeting with the FHA to, because uh, we need the FHA to subsidize the loan before we can get the loan from HUD. So- See that woman signing the paper? That's my mother. Who's talking? Marguerite Voluntuk. Oh. Hi, Marguerite. Hi. Um, I thought that was Deanna, and then somebody recently told me it wasn't. So it is. It's my mother. Word, thank you. Thank you very much. For um, because I'm gonna have her mislabeled in another place, I'm afraid. And that's my Lola behind her. 
Um, Paula Daklin. Daklin, yeah. yeah. I knew them both, but a long time ago. So the FHA, what is it again, Marguerite? Marguerite in Nevada. In Nevada, okay. Well, thank you, Marguerite. I don't think we ever met, but I, I knew your parents. I saw you, I spent some time with your dad during his last days in the hospital. So here, um, go on. So here is a group um, meeting with, as part of the AFO meeting with FHA, I mean, not FHA, but HUD people signing the agreement, but they'd already started the work. As soon as they found out the that FHA was going to back for the loan, they started to work with the $10,000 that they had. And by the time the agreement was signed a few months later with HUD, they had already work was already underway. Mel, is that you in the background? What's that? Is that is that Mel in the background with Ted? No, that's my brother Frank. <laughs> yeah, there's okay, Frank. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Ted Lapus. Now. Now I'm confused. Uh, this uh, is this really Mrs. Buholano or is it Mrs. Bolantuk? It's my mother, Deanna okay. Bolantuk. Okay, so I got to change that. Thank you very much, Maggie. I'm very sorry. No worries. And even Leonida Unsud and Jose, the young Jose. Oh me. my goodness! <laughs> so when he was looking like that, so the actual construction only took a year. Vice President of the Philippines came to do the ground to participate in the groundbreaking, which was a big deal. So here's some steps in the construction. And finally, 1972, August, it was completed. And August 12th, it was opened up for rental, the 128 units, 10 stories, two-story commercial building. And here it is from above, thanks to Google Earth. So the 10-story residential building, the two-story commercial building with a larger footprint, the patio where there's uh, places to sit eh, and socialize, the playground that was in use when the kids from the center still use it, but it was in use mainly during the time there was a, a uh, preschool here. This was at the first Barrio Fiesta. Does anybody recognize these two people? That's Narcy. What's that? Is that Narcy? Narcy Kiba. Oh, wow. Yeah, Narcy Kiba. Yeah, by the time I met Narcy, he, did, he didn't look like that. Wow, okay, thank you for, for identifying Narcy. So Narcy was in on preparing yeah, with the uh, wow barbecuing at the first the first barrio fiesta. Most years since then, there's been a barrio fiesta, but we've missed a few years now. And hopefully, we will get back to it. The twentieth barrio fiesta in 1992 was just one year before the freeway was completed. So by the time the freeway was completed, 23 years or 24 years after much of Little Manila was destroyed, people, at least some of the people who had moved to the Filipino Center from Little Manila had already passed away. Does anybody know those people in that picture? Uh, no, do you, do, you, do you? The one on the bottom looks like my papa. So I'm not sure. Rosario Docklin on the bottom. Wow. And do you know who? And do you know who made this sign? I don't know who made it. I don't. Maybe I could, I'll try to find out. But... Looks like my dad's handwriting, but I don't know. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So here's when the freeway finally was. 
Yeah, the finally, finally was uh, completed in 1993. And here's the Filipino Center where some of the people had moved. Some of the activities going on in the Filipino Center during Barrio Fiestas, you'll see people you know in here for sure. There's Virginia and I think uh, Cal Rumius, a photographer, Lois and and uh, Denise. Here's Philip behind the sign. I think that's w w one of the uh, city council members. More performances during Mario Fiesta. Every Christmas, the center puts on a Christmas party for all any of the residents who want to come. And they have presents for everybody, not only the children, but every every single resident gets a, a present if they have to come to the Christmas party. There's some special events like the senior prom, prom for seniors like the Frank uh, Gadula originated, and I would like to continue it. Some of you may have known Rose. She passed away a couple of years ago, but at 90, she was 90 years old and still dancing, albeit with a, a walker, but she never, nothing stopped her from dancing. Here's Doris, um, the current president of AFO, dancing with Frank, but he's, he's hidden from my view. The Stockton Multi-Style Screamer multi Group has been exercising, has been practicing at the center for years. And they had weekly, weekly classes there and, week, and the second weekly class at Delta College. They provide free martial arts and self-defense training to Filipino center residents, plus any other community members that wish to wish to partake, and hopefully this can start up again soon when the pandemic uh, finally settles down. Some practice going on outside, I think, for the uh, Filipino <clears throat> for the Barrio Fiesta group. Some of you know Jay Fowler who practices with, with that, but he also opened a little school of his own in Sacramento. We give away, the, the um, AFO gives away a scholarship every year, actually more than one. Last year we gave four, this year because of the pandemic, we didn't, didn't have the scholarship. Jose was recognized in various ways for his contributions and he also got involved with politics. He's on the school board, ran for uh, supervisor, but didn't didn't make it, he lost by a few votes. So Jose was a leader in the movement, but he wasn't the only one involved. There, these are the five first members of the AFO organization members and five others, they don't have their names, uh, <clears throat> joined up after that and each contributed $1,000 Remember to make the ten thousand uh, dollar pot of money, so we have some seed money. And after the loan was obtained from HUD, then the thousand dollars that each organization put up was returned to them. So each each organization got the thousand dollars back without interest. You should find. What's that? You should find the names from all those people too, because I see you Ted, know. and I see my papa, and I see Jose, I see Mrs. Unsud. I don't see yeah, my I mother. Recognize, yeah, I recognize some people, but not, whoops. Okay, yeah. is this Marguerite still talking? Yeah, it's me. Okay, Marguerite, send me an email or something so I can get your help. Okay, this is Ted, is right there. My pop is the third one, Rosario Daclan, the third one on the left. And that's standing next to um, Jose. That's Jose. Yeah. Go left. That's my papa. Oh, yeah. There he is, right there. That's your papa. Daklin. Oh, you, you mean your grandfather? Yes. That's what oh, okay. I was looking for your dad, and I said, "What? What?" Oh no. Okay. 
And that's Mrs. Unstead, right? Right there on the second, on the right, right there? Yeah, that's Mrs. Unstead. Okay, and I don't know these other ladies. That's pretty good. You have to remember, I was only 12 when this happened. Yeah. So you're three years younger than my mom when she got married. Mm. Been there, done that. I know. So, so thank you, Marguerite. I'll get your help in, in naming everybody. No worries. So here's Jose with an article that appeared. Uh, oh, it was a calendar, huh? So Jose was pointing out here that Senator brought the uh, brought the world's attention, the idea, uh, at least the local world's attention to Filipinos suddenly were visible. They became part of the community. Jose, and perhaps some of you had some unpleasant experiences um, with regard to racial discrimination. But his, Jose and his wife, Helen, Jose was born in the Philippines and when he was 14 years old, he joined the and then they end at Hukbahala fighting against the invaders, Japanese army when he was 14 years old. And then he joined the US Navy later and later came to the US. And then he uh, met and married Helen. And they saved up money and wanted to buy a house. And so they went shopping for a house they found one they liked by UOP, but they found out that no Filipinos were allowed to live there. And this was Mr. Groupie, not the current Groupie, but his father that, that told him that. But that was, that was the rule back then. It wasn't necessarily just Groupie, but everybody. Um, and my mother faced the same problem in the same area when we were living on a farm on the right track out in the islands, um, kind of northwest of, of uh, Stockton. And she tried to rent a house in uh, to, close to UOP after my sister started a school at Lincoln Elementary in about 1950 or so. But she couldn't because she was white, but she could not rent a house because her husband was Filipino. Which too, that was devastating to her. This is a, the board has existed a few years ago. And the only, whoops. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep doing this. So Phil and the Sparrows, uh, these are women that work in the office, Nancy and uh, Vanessa. Jose, about a year, less than a year before he passed away, representative of, the, of our then management company since we changed. Doris Vincent, president of AFO. That's me, that's Lois Sayun, secretary and Denise Rico, treasurer of AFO. So we thank the Manungs that kind of paved the way for us. But we also thank the Filipino organizations that, that got together to provide housing for at least some of the Manungs that were being displaced from little Manila when it was destroyed. So there's little, there's the residential building of the Filipino Center in 1972 when it was newly completed. This is the residential building now, 49 years later. It still looks really good from the outside and the apartments are really well maintained, but it needs now a lot, a lot of, of, um, of work to get it back in tip top shape. So we're working on that. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of the Filipino Center. So on Saturday, August 20th, we're going to have a 50, a Filipino Center Golden Jubilee at the Stock, Stockton Golf and Country Club. And we will hope to see everyone there. And that is it. I had a little video that I intended to show, but it's something that messed up with my computer. I was afraid to try to restart it to get the, the video. Okay. 
So thank you everybody for attending. And let me see if I can put this down and see everybody. Now is my ugly screen showing up still? Yes, we you see your desktop. Okay, how do I get my desktop off there? It's embarrassing. Stop sharing. Okay, let me find out how to stop sharing. Um, oh, well. Is it something that, let's see. Just exit at the top. <laughs> you if I, uh, uh, well, this is. Wait, I, there. Hey. I stopped you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for stopping me. I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was. I once heard that Jose Bernardo was the architect for the building. No, that's not true. Okay. The, the the work was contracted to a company in Sacramento, including the architecture, the architecture and construction. And somewhere I have the name of the company, but I forget what it uh, what it was. Okay. But Jose was a contractor himself, but uh, he did not do the Filipino Center. And I don't know who did. I mean, I, I, had the I don't have the name of the actual architect, but of the company. If you want it, I can get it for you. No, that's all right. I just wondered if he was. Uh, our, our oh, looky, it's Luna. Yes, hi, Richard. Very nice presentation. Um, I have a, I, are there tickets, uh, where can I get a ticket for the Jubilee next Saturday? Are they uh, at the door or what? No, the, the, the next, it's not, next it's year. Next Saturday, it's next year, 2022. And I mean, I, I know, next year, yeah. but I mean, um, the tickets, okay, so. Lois Sahun is handling the tickets. And if you get the newsletter, her email is there. If not, email me and I will email you her address. I'm sorry I didn't put it on the screen. Well, I'd like to help on that committee if oh, they need help. Yeah, I'll talk to Doris about that also. But no. I just wanted to add that um, it, inside the Filipino Center, I mean, there were some really good programs going on in the early years, in, 19, yeah. uh, in the 80s yeah. especially. We had the... Um, the Filipino Multi Service Center uh, had offices out of there, and that was a program that really reached out to a lot of recent immigrants. And I worked with Morris Artiaga then. I see yeah. Allison, you're there, yeah. and um, so it was really a, a it was really a, a a focal point for a lot of not just the um, the existing Filipino community, but a lot yeah. of the new Filipinos that were that were trying to transition into uh, you know the labor market, and so there were um, job training uh, programs available. We did a lot of mock interview type things, and I think you know the the center was not just you know residential and not just no. commercial. It really was community no. services as well. So I just wanted to add that. And yeah, um, thank you. And some yeah. of the services were going on until our service director left us a couple of years ago, Frank Kabula, and we need to hire somebody else. And uh, actually, I'd, I'd like Frank. I would mind. I'd like to get Frank back if we could, but <clears throat> may not be able to. But yes, we need those programs. Too. And uh, thank you for bringing that out. And Luna has been involved in a lot of stuff from the from early on in the early seventies, uh, along with Mel. And uh, thank you, Luna. And I, I, I'm gonna have to get contact okay. you and get more of that information from you. So, Richard, yes, um, great, uh, great introduction to the to the uh, Filipino Center. I'd like to add a few things to it. Okay. In that, uh, uh, one of the details of, of acquiring the loan through uh, the redevelopment agency and through HUD was the, the development of the, uh, uh, it was a case study. It's called the Roadblocks to Community uh, Building. Yeah. And uh, 
Lorena Cabanero and Lillian Gallegos were two key players. Uh, they were UC Davis students at the time, but spent several years, uh, 68 through 70, uh, yeah. working on, on, the, uh, on that particular project. And, and the, uh, the document itself, the case study itself, was used uh, as, as the foundation information for the actual acquisition of a loan through HUD. So, so we have some uh, uh, key players, you know, along with, with Jose that, that uh, made the Filipino Center possible. And that document is, is, is available. Uh, Lorena handed out a few copies I happen to have a copy of it, and um, it really it really defines uh, what happened when that crosstown freeway uh, actually came about, and all the displacement uh, that happened. And they actually documented uh, how many families uh, had had been displaced, and especially like you had mentioned, the elderly um, uh, uh, Filipino men. Who were living in that area, how they were displaced uh, inequitably, and and one of the data points was was back then, the uh, California established the poverty level at at four thousand dollars a year, and some of the people that were displaced because of the crosstown freeway, the the uh, elderly uh, Filipino guys were making less than. Uh, 3,000 a year, they were living on that. So it was, it was uh, very critical that the, some equitable housing uh, be developed. And um, it, was, it was quite a, a, a project for the community to come together to do that. And uh, in that case study, there's actually uh, uh, some documentation that, that said not the whole Filipino community was uh, behind the Filipino Center. And there was, there was some, um, um, I guess, resentment on, on the part of uh, some other organizations about accepting federal funding as quote unquote uh, welfare. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, we, uh, they were managed to overcome those, those hurdles and, uh, and move forward. But uh, you brought up some real good points, and a, another good point about Jose Bernardo because of because of his uh, um, building, his structural, his con uh, building contracting uh, expertise. Uh, when they did put the Filipino Center together, uh, he recommended uh, fender blocks, which which literally means that the Filipino Center is is basically. Uh, um, a almost a fireproof uh, uh, a building, and it turns out that uh, that if there was a fire in the Filipino Center, it would be it would be uh, actually contained to a small portion of the building. Yeah. Uh, Jose's involvement on the technical end was was uh, pretty critical. So he worked directly with the with the architects that build that building and kind of walked through the steps with them. So it was just a uh, it was just a nice combination of people that came together uh, with different skill sets that helped put that uh, whole thing together. And um, it was I was proud to be a part of it uh, during my few years and. Uh, the Barrio Fests that you mentioned uh, really bring the community together. It's a source of pride, uh, not only from an administrative part. When I say administrative part, uh, when HUD allowed the uh, funding for the Filipino Center, uh, it was considered what they call a multi-use. And I don't believe HUD uh, actually allows any more multi-use, which means housing plus commercial complex funded. So Filipino Center is very unique in that sense. And uh, it's also unique 
and, and the fact that uh, the building material that went into that building is, is fairly fire safe. And the, uh, the county and, and local fire departments actually train there at the Filipino Center to, uh, uh, for high rise um, rescues yeah. during fires. So yeah. it's, a, it's quite a, a source of pride locally and, and throughout the United States, they know about the Filipino Center. Thank you, Ron. In the, uh, the report you mentioned by the Davis students, I'm aware of, and Lorena uh, told me she gave three copies to Jose, but I can't find any of them. And uh, I don't know, a year or more, or more ago, I checked all the libraries and well, couldn't find a copy nearby. Stanford has a copy, I think, and a few others. Yeah. But then just yesterday, I checked Delta College. I checked them earlier too, and they didn't have it, at least in their catalog. But I checked yesterday, and it's in the catalog. But it, they were the uh, when I found it, it was I couldn't I couldn't get to the library. But I've been dying to see it, and I'd like to know what happened to the three copies. Of, I guess they were in Jose's office, and the, maybe the family cleaned out in the office and, and took them. Because Jose's family came to clean out the office, but I haven't haven't checked with them yet. But yes, that is a document that I need to see. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, Richard? Yes. There was just one thing, and um, this is kind of, uh, and a lot of people don't even know this, but uh -huh. in 1972, um, because the Filipino Center had so much attention when we were at the 1971 Far West uh, Filipino Conference in Seattle, the yeah. Stockton, Stockton was yeah. named the site of uh, the next conference because of the grand opening that was expected on the Filipino Center. And one of the things that happened at, at, the, at our conference, I don't know, Mel, if you remember this, but there was a, there was a small delegation of, of a people from the Bay Area that were really upset because um, of the HUD FHA restrictions that would not allow all Filipinos to be residents because of the fact that it was a federally funded project, right? So at our conference, just before um, it was ending, Morris and I found out that the Bay Area folks had a uh, signs that were ready. They were going to be marching down with um, four letter expletives, you know, saying F you pretty much to HUD and FHA. So we had a meeting with, uh, Morris and I had a meeting with these Bay Area folks and we just pretty, we pretty much told them, look, the Bay Area, you guys have your business there. We don't go over there and mess up your turf. This is our turf. You know, this is our backyard. You guys don't come in here and, you know, try to, you know, uh, because you're, you don't like what HUD FHA, we may not have liked it either. But the thing is, the fact is, you know, it is, it is a fairly funded project. We are the ones that need to deal with it. So anyway, they did put down their picket signs. And so we were able to squash something that could have been, um, you know, could have been a real uh, issue and could have been yeah. a real damper yeah. on the dedication of, of the center. Because right after our conference ended, we immediately went to uh, the Filipino center and were there for its grand opening. I don't know if you remember that, Mel. Do you remember any of that? Yeah. Um, let me just a couple of comments. I guess the bottom line is, is when uh, there, uh, the idea of of not having all Filipinos in the Filipino Center is um, is a technically a, a incorrect statement. When you have federal funding that comes from all nationalities across the board. Uh, you cannot uh, discriminate who goes into that Filipino yeah. center yeah, we understand simply that. because we all pay taxes across right. the board. So, so that's, that's the main technical uh, um, reason for, for opening the Filipino center up to uh, mm -hmm. all nationalities. But in reality, if you look at the data, there are quite a few Filipinos that do live in the Filipino Center. And uh, there is an effort to, to, to look for as many 
Filipinos who, who can qualify to live there. So, um, you know, I, I hear you, Luna, when, when, when people uh, uh, object to, to certain things, I think you gotta kind of look at some of the detail behind that. And, and that's the bottom line is, is when you have federal funding is that you can, cannot discriminate. I think one major factor is, is we got to name the center, the Filipino Center, and uh, which is advertisement in itself and a monumental uh, um, move in the right direction in, in terms of marketing uh, the Filipino American experience. So, and I think Richard said it uh, well in his presentation, it, the Filipino Center and the coalition of the AFO really showed the rest of the minority community that, because this was one of the first at that time, if the first minority owned sponsored uh, a federally funded project. And so they really, uh, the AFO uh, coalition really did, um, they were trail they were trail blazers. And so was the Filipino yeah. Center. So that will never change, no matter what. Hey, Beverly, Beverly's been trying to say something. Well, I was going to say something because uh, my comadre's there. I met my husband at. Hi, Ida. <laughs> I met my ha husband through Ida that's waving right now at the Filipino Center. And it's been 45 years this August that um, I, I met my husband there. And now in October, we'll be married for 45 years. So and Mr. Daklin was the uh, was the one who also showed Anthony to where I was. My booth was at that Filipino um, Barrio Fiesta. So I needed to put that in because my husband's watching and my camaraderie's there and homage to Mrs. David there and uh, with Mr. Daklin. And it's on tape. So I got kudos from my husband now. Thank I you. Were, I love that you were able to roast, <laughs> roast the pig on the UOP campus. Oh, yeah. Well, that too. And I have a tree that Bernardo told me to plant this tree, and it's still standing, and it's still alive right there in the parking lot. Where? Maybe that's why my back is not doing too good. <laughs> oh. So good memories, everybody. Good memories. Yeah, really. Letty, did you like the picture of Frank? I loved it. <laughs> Thank you. And you know what? He was in that barber chair, the front. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't he know that. He was in the first chair, getting his hair cut. <laughs> wow. That was done by Wallace Stegner's photographer. Wallace Stegner wrote the book. Or yeah, actually, that's where I got the pictures from Wallace Stegner's book. One Nation, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Frank took the photographer around the Delta and around Stockton. That picture of the hotel, no Filipinos allowed. That was one place Frank brought the photographer to. Uh -huh. So that poster was made up a lot, but it came from Stegner's story. Uh. You stated that uh, Frank called Little Manila in Los Angeles, uh, the Filipino area, Little Manila. But uh, he did that here for Stockton. When he came up to Stockton, he called El Dorado Street, he called it Little Manila. Uh -huh. That's where that started. Yeah, the woman that wrote that article called Little Manila was a, a friend of my daughter's when they were in school. And uh, that's how I happened to find out about the article. It's not well known. Yeah. Does anybody have any more questions for Richard? Or comments? Uh, Richard, I just want to add that Dr. Sageton was there in that uh, Filipino Center for many years, as well as Dr. Nose, pediatrician, and Dr. Spiritu. And there was a Rizal pharmacy. That's right. Let's see, Dr. Saget, let's see, which, which Dr. Spiritu had an office there? Uh, Norma Spiritu, the pediatrician, but they only stayed for a short time. 
Uh huh. Yeah, I knew Norma. I didn't know. I didn't realize she ever had an office there. Where do you? And we, what at? We, Richard, this is Elena. Uh, Grace oh. and I are in cahoots with this part of history. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, uh, Dr. Norma Espiritu actually handed down the business to Dr. Nose because uh, she just arrived, I believe, from another state and she settled here. So she was essentially uh, hosted by the Espiritus. So that, that's Dr. Margarita Nose. She's also a pediatrician. And then let's uh, honor also um, Ted. Ted Lapus, because he's in his 90s, but sharp as a tact. Maybe one of these days uh, we can visit him and kind of reminisce and identify the faces that are on those pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ted Lapus, he's 97 now, I believe. Yeah. And what was the, the doctor's, uh, it was Margarita. Margarita, Margarita Nose. How do you spell that? N O S C E. N O S C E? Yes. No C. And then, of course, as an extension, uh, Bernie Giva is living in Modesto in an a assisted facility. Um, she wishes to be with the group today, but if no one can help her with the Zoom, she said, uh, just play it back to me another time. So uh -huh. I may have to go and visit her and play this back to her. Uh huh. Yeah, we'll we'll be uploading it to the the YouTube channel um, yes. la her, later today because it, it takes a couple of hours. Or her son, yes. Thank you, okay. Terry. And I yeah. I may edit out the little part at the beginning if I if I want to test my editing skills again. Okay. Of, uh, when Richard was trying to uh, figure out how to share, but we'll see. It was. Was Dr. Batista ever in the Filipino Center or was he too no, early for that? No, he was on the south end. Oh. Question, Richard. Uh, do you have a social services coordinator now that uh, Frank Catula is has moved on? We don't. We've been, uh, were they, we've been looking for one along with the management company. Yeah. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a, a major plus for the Filipino Center to have a social services coordinator on that site, and uh, Frank really set the set the the bar real high when in terms of, of working with the residents in that building, and um, yeah. it was it was a it was a major plus to have a social services coordinator. Yeah, he took him to doctor's appointments. He took him shopping, and. Yeah, it was true. in addition to social events. Yeah. The, um, Dr. Bautista, this is kind of an aside, but I've been looking at uh, far, a Filipino farm worker strikes along the coast in the 1930s. And I see Dr. Bautista was over there negotiating as a negotiator with the farmers or unions or whatever. So he was really an all-around man. Huh? He was one of the first presidents of the Filipino community in the early 30s. He was, huh? And he was elected several times. He was such a good president. And he was president when the first Filipino strike on the asparagus in April of 39. Uh, he was president of the community and started, uh, he organized the Filipino Agriculture Labor Association called Paula. So he was very instrumental in helping the people when they hold the strike. You know what, Auntie Letty? Um, there's got to be something, some chemical in your body that accounts for this amazing memory of yours. If we can isolate it, we can make a fortune selling it. <laughs> I don't know about that. I sir wants it. Yeah, I needed. Wow. Well, you know, you. somebody needs to do a shout out to Ida Rabinal Caramo, and you know, only because I knew it because I worked with her and oh, and Jose 
Uh, and that was in the early 70s. And Ida was really Jose's right-hand man, a right-hand woman oh. <laughs> who took care of a lot oh. of things, um, you know, that he was also working on in the community. I know it was, I think it was the office. Ida, you're, you need to unmute if you want to talk. But anyway, it was the Valley she's... Area Construction <sighs> Opportunity Program, BACA. And so Ida she's... worked very, very hard with Jose. And I just wanted to give her, um, you know, kudos for hanging in there with Jose because he threw a lot at her that, you know, she just took it in, in her stride. But so anyway, Ida, can you hear me? Thank you, comadre. She's crying right now. Crying. <laughs> uh, oh, Ida. <laughs> Ida, are you on unmute? Elizabeth? Thank you, Luna. And Richard, thank you very much um, <clears throat> for taking me down uh, memory lane there uh, with Mel and Luna and, and Beverly. But there were, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I have allergies here in Hawaii. Yeah. But um, they, there were a lot of people behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, they, they were very quiet. Like Warren Wong helped Jose with the with uh, architectural um, advice, and there was the the one that really stuck out in my mind was the Zuckerman Law Firm. Um, we had several meetings with them, um, with Jose, because um, uh, they needed uh, legal advice as far as just like what Mel was saying. You have a federally funded contract, and you need uh, to abide by those rules and. Um, Anyway, long story short, they, they gave a lot of advice, but that was the Zuckerman um, um, uh, family and they had a law firm, but they also supported a lot of the Filipinos, um, yeah. uh, the old, old monos, mm -hmm. and um, they provided, uh, because they had a lot of land where uh, they, uh, a lot of, they had a lot of farm uh, Filipinos who worked for them. So they always supported them. So yeah, Jose was a handful, a big handful, <laughs> but that's okay. But you worked hard for <laughs> him, Ida. Just, you worked so hard. <laughs> so, it was Ida, a name of love for our folks. Ida, um, are you related to Linda and Elizabeth? Yes, I'm married to their, um, their uh, bratty brother. Oh. Hey, she's not online here, Ida. <laughs> Oh, yes, to my, my she's my beautiful uh, uh, sister-in-law. Uh-huh. <laughs> so to contact you, we can do, or find out your contact information. We just go to Linda or Elizabeth, huh? <laughs> but, um, again, thank you, Richard, for the opportunity to, to listen to your presentation. Well, thank you all of you for your input and teaching me things. Really appreciate it. Anybody else have any questions for Richard or comments? Reminiscing? Yeah. Anything else you want to say, Richard, or, is, or are you ready to end the session? No, I'm ready to end. I just want to thank everybody, and I'm you know, humbled by all the, you know, all this knowledge floating around that I need to get hold of. Um, all these wonderful right. people. Thank you. Right. People like Marguerite and, and Ida, if you want to email Richard um, for any other um, information about the center and, and, and uh, um, the Dr. Barzaga left. Um, but anyway, uh, especially to identify those photographs and anybody in them, send him information. Um, you can either send it through, well, his email is, you want to say your email, Richard? Sure. Yeah. We can oh. find it online, can't we? Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's rtanaza at aol.com, or you can go through okay. the museum um, and we'll just forward it on to him. But, okay, no um, worries. Terry, yeah. kudos to you, man. I get all your emails and I love it. And okay. Beverly, thank you. And You're Anthony welcome. was in my uncle's wedding. 
Right? <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> yes, he was. Okay. Okay. Grand. All right. Thank you again, okay. Marguerite. Bye, guys. Bye. Right, thank you, Richard. Bye, thank Ida. You, Richard. I love you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. And we'll be having a presentation in September. We're still working on that. And then, of course, third Sunday of the month, something will be happening either online or at the museum. We'll have to see how it works with COVID. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye, Monong Robert. <laughs> Bye, Monong Robert. Oh, thank you. Harry, Harry uh, just, Robert, just, wow. just, just wanted to say thanks to, I'm sorry, Robert, uh, to Marilyn Guida. She was a uh, curator at Hagen Museum. And oh. She was a, a major supporter of Bonds. So uh, uh, Marilyn, can't yes, see you, thank you, Marilyn. Thank Hi. you, Marilyn. Hello, thank you, Marilyn. everyone. I've, I've just enjoyed the memory lane also. And I'm sad for the people that we, we don't have with us anymore. But wonderful to see you all. And thank you, Richard, for a wonderful presentation. You too. Thank, thank you, you, Marilyn. Wow. Awesome. Sorry, I'm, I'm living in, in, a, in a place where I haven't unpacked in uh, over six months. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, not uh, nothing to look at here. <laughs> Take well, care, you guys. I'll yeah. I'll be I'll be listening for the next uh, Zoom meeting. Okay. <laughs> anything else, Richard? Richard Robert, did yeah. you have anything you wanted to say? Uh, yeah. Being old school, uh, Richard, if you could make a hard copy print, put it in the museum so people can read through it. Not everybody has YouTube or goes to the website. So mm -hmm. at, least, uh, at least that, because um, uh, at the other museum I work at, the uh, I do that. Uh, for the exhibits so that people can see the a little more detail than the what's the, the item being displayed. But yeah. for your talk for the Philippine uh, Center, um, that's a that's an eye opener for me because uh, I've I think I've been to the center only once for uh, some kind of a dance or something like that. Uh, but I had no idea of the background. So it's probably going to be revealing to myself as well as other chapter members. They ought to know all about that too. And the work that was done in Stockton, that's yeah. monumental. I, I, I can't believe it. <laughs> in fact, I, as I kept on looking at the building, I thought, does that building have a life cycle? I mean, is it gonna, after 50 years, you know, somebody's, some, somebody's gonna inspect that building. So yeah, it's one of those things that I always worry about. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff that we need to do. Yeah, because we had that for the- It cost $2.8 million to build it, to build it back in, 1972, but it's going to cost us more than that to fix it up. Yeah, that's the building code in 1972, right? And of course, a lot of bureaucrats love to say, "Well, that's way back then, 50 years ago. The uh, building code has now changed, and we gotta, we gotta go through an upgrade of some kind." Did you get the newsletter, uh, Robert? No, not the chap, not a Stockton chapter newsletter. But because there's a story in the chat, the Stockton chapter newsletter about the Filipino Center. Yeah. Okay. Great. Robert, just a, just a footnote for your interest. Uh, uh, the Filipino Center was paid in full 40 year mortgage in 2012. And uh, I'm, that, yes. I'm, I'm sure that the board has, has looked at uh, um, plans, you know, to to upgrade and to uh, uh, bring things up to standards. But that was a monumental task uh, of, of paying that 40 year loan off by an all volunteer group. Yeah, well, uh, I don't wanna add a new, you know, let me add a little bit more comment about uh, upgrades. Um, we, uh, at the Filipino Community Center in San Jose, we had a 88th year anniversary celebration and um, Part of the celebration was the update ADA compliant restrooms. And that was a, a major expense for us oh. just to go ADA compliant. We weren't prior to that. And when you do ADA compliant, that's a major expense, but uh, we got through it and, uh, and, it, and it's now functioning really well. And we even had it blessed by a priest. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> Okay, Thank anything you. else? I, 
Well, yeah, thank you, Richard, for the presentation. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, mm. I will sign off now if okay. everybody's ready to go. Yes. Yep. Thank you. You want five? Okay. Thank you. All right.